Mike is going to come and read for us. Good morning. Exodus 29, 10 through 21. The reading of the Lord's word. And thou shalt cause a bullock to be brought before the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron and his sons shall put their hands upon the head of the bullock. And thou shalt kill the bullock before the Lord by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And thou shalt take of the blood of the bullock and put it upon the horns of the altar with thy finger and pour all the blood beside the bottom of the altar. And thou shalt take all the fat that covereth the inwards and the caul that is above the liver and the two kidneys and the fat that is upon them and burn them upon the altar. But the flesh of the bullock and his skin and his dung shalt thou burn with fire without the camp it is a sin offering. Thou shalt also take one ram, and Aaron and his sons shall put their hands upon the head of the ram. And thou shalt slay the ram, and thou shalt take his blood and sprinkle it around about the altar. And thou shalt cut the ram in pieces, and wash the inwards of him, and put his legs, and put them unto his pieces, and unto his head. And thou shalt burn the whole ram upon the altar. It is a burnt offering unto the Lord. It is a sweet savor, an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And thou shalt take the other ram, and Aaron and his sons shall put their hands upon the head of the ram. Then thou shalt kill the ram, and take of his blood, and put it upon the tip of the right ear of Aaron, and upon the tip of the right ear of his sons, and upon the thumb of their right hand, and upon the great toe of their right foot, and sprinkled the blood upon the altar round about. And thou shalt take of the blood that is upon the altar, and of the anointing oil, and sprinkle it upon Aaron, and upon his garments, and upon his sons, and upon the garments of his sons with him, and he shall be hallowed, and his garments and his sons, and his sons' garments with him. Let us pray. Lord, we're thankful that you have determined that we would be here today to hear your word preached. We're thankful for the pictures of Christ that we have just read in this passage, and that we know that he's made full satisfaction for the demands of your law. Please bless us as we hear the preaching of your word. Amen. Someone said at one time that the Bible is a bloody book. And that is so, that right from the beginning in Genesis all the way through the New Testament, we read about blood shed. You might ask, well, why such a bloody book? Well, it goes all the way back to the fall, that God had said the day that they ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they would die. Some would mock and say, well, they didn't die immediately. They did. They died spiritually. There was a death that occurred upon the disobedience of Adam. And their first thought was to cover their nakedness with fig leaves. That represents works religion. That's what people try to do. They try to cover up their nakedness before God. They feel a little guilty sometimes and they think, well, I better get busy serving God or I get a, better get back to worship or doing all these things that are nothing but fig leaves. The scriptures are pretty clear that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sins. Amen. And God is the first who ever preached the gospel in scripture. When you go back and look in Genesis chapter 2, what did he do? He took the fig leaves off of Adam and Eve and he slew some innocent animals that had not sinned and he shed their blood. It was a shedding of blood unto death because death had to be answered by death. And yet the glory of that picture is that he did not kill Adam and Eve physically, but he took the blood, the shed blood and shed it and then took the skins of those animals and clothed them. And right there was the very first gospel ever preached. Imagine Adam and Eve looking at that blood flowing out and seeing those innocent animals 
lying there now dead in their place, how that must have struck their very hearts. And we know that that's what the Lord taught them because you remember Cain and Abel? When they came before the Lord, Cain thought he'd get a little bit creative. He thought, well, why not present the best works of my hands? What was he doing? He was going back to the fig leaves, thinking that somehow God would accept that. And when the Lord refused Cain and his offering, is what it says there in Genesis 4, he became upset. He was wroth. It's like a lot of people today, when you tell them your works don't count for anything and can only bring condemnation on you if you ever try to present yourself before God with those works, the works of your hands, they're dirty, they're filthy. And he was wroth. But what do you say? Go and do that which is right, which was what? Go get a sacrifice. That's what Abel brought. That's why Abel was accepted before God. It wasn't because he was better than Cain, but he brought an animal, an innocent animal, and slew it and brought that sacrifice before the Lord. You say, where did Abel learn that? He learned it from Adam and Eve. And so it was all the way down through the history, all the way through Israel, what we're reading about here in Exodus. The slain of animals. It's not a pretty picture. You think about the hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of animals that were slain between the time that God slew the first one, all the way, the thousands of years, up to the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, the Bible is a bloody book. And it's all about offerings for sin, leading up to one offering. Imagine that, that in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, he fulfilled and satisfied all that those Old Testament offerings were typifying in pictures and type. But I'll tell you, the picture here, as we read the scriptures, is not like you see in some of these storybooks, where everything looks pristine, clean. Have you ever seen those depictions, the priests? are just there in their white robes and everything around looks so clean and here comes the little lamb along they're bringing along and you know kids look at that and think oh that looks pretty good that's not the picture the picture would be more like a butcher shop where these priests had the blood stains of these animals on their robes yes we saw last time in our study here in Exodus 29 how they were consecrated, how they were set apart. And those robes represent the robe of righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, without which none can stand before God. But I'll tell you, those robes were stained with blood, just like our Lord Jesus Christ himself, stained with blood, that God might be satisfied. So that's what I want us to look at. Once a month, when we meet around the Lord's table, we come back here. We've been going through the Old Testament, started in Genesis. I don't remember how many years ago. <laughs> Initially, I was just going to try to hop, skip, and jump through, presenting pictures of Christ and his death as we gather around the Lord's table. But you can't rush through this. Here we are now in Exodus. We've been going through this for a while. And now we're coming to the sacrifices. We saw a picture of the tabernacle. We saw that the furniture of the tabernacle, how it represented the Lord Jesus Christ. We saw the priests set apart, how they represented the Lord Jesus Christ, and now the sacrifices. So the next few times that we meet around the Lord's table, this is what we're going to look at, the sacrifices. And here in this particular text, we have three offerings for sin. And that's the title of this message offerings for sin we know that there's one offering for sin that ever satisfied holy god that's the offering of his son the lord jesus christ but all of these plural represented in type and picture and prophecy his one sacrifice that's that's how infinite christ's sacrifice was because it takes all of these pictures how do you even with one offering depict the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't. It took all of these together. So that's why it's a beautiful picture book as we go through the Old Testament. But here in verses 10 through 14, 
that we read, we have what's called the sin offering. That's what offerings are about, because of sin. Were it not for sin, there would not be the necessity of an offering unto death. But because sin, by one man's sin entered into the world in death by sin, therefore it required then by way of substitution. That's really what we're seeing here in the death of these animals. And I know if you're an animal lover and you think about these being slain and you're just kind of getting queasy thinking about it, but just think about why it was necessary. God ordered it. In fact, he raised these animals. He created them. They were preserved for that one purpose, that they might be offered in the place of a people that he purposed to save. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ came into the world. And who was he? The Lamb of God. That was John the Baptist's message. Behold the Lamb. He didn't look like a lamb, but he was the Lamb of God because he came to fulfill all that these Old Testament sacrifices and lambs depicted. But first, the sin offering. Here in verses 10 through 14, Aaron and his sons, it says there in verse 10, were to take and put their hands on the head. In this case, it was a bullock. Think of a big male bull. I was driving by the other day in a field and saw all these cows out there and then there's this big old bull standing off by himself he looked ferocious why a bullock well it represented an animal in its strength you can see why that would be a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ because he did not die for any infirmity in himself in fact had he not been destined to lay down his life he would have lived forever as a man but that's not why he came into this world. That's why, not why the Father sent him into this world. And so the bullock here is an apt description of the Lord Jesus Christ as the strength of the sacrifice that was to shed his blood. When men had done all that they could to him, you remember his final words that he cried from the cross. He didn't die in weakness. He didn't die with a whisper. Or, a, or a wimp he cried with a loud voice and you can imagine those standing around the cross hearing that cry it is finished they're looking at a man that's hanging on the tree and yet it's not Christ said no man takes my life I lay it down myself when he had cried that the scriptures say he bowed his head he bowed his head and gave up his spirit to the father in fact, that word in the original literally means he pillowed his head. We don't think of that in death, especially a death of that manner, but that's what he did. So submitted was he to his father's will right up to his death that when he cried, it is finished, he pillowed his head. No man took his life. Well, that's the picture we have here that this sin offering, this washing at the door of the tabernacle was that the priest did was only one aspect of the symbol of the cleansing from sin. There had to be the shedding of blood. None of this took place without the shedding of blood. Just as we know, there's no justification of sinners. There's no sanctification of sinners. There's no righteousness apart from the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see them here taking and putting their hands, it says, on the head of the bullock in verse 10. And that word in Hebrew means more than just lightly placing the hand on the head. It gives the idea here of actually pressing hard down on the bullock's head. They came and each one leaned upon the victim, loading him, and that's the picture there, with the burden of the sin that was represented in them laying the hand on the head. That represents what? Substitution. 
That's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. In his sin offering. There was no sin in him. But Isaiah said there in Isaiah 53. That the sin was laid upon him. We can't even imagine. What that means. To have not just my sin. But the sin of his people. The weight of it. That's, that's what the scriptures mean. When it says he was made to be sin. He wasn't made sinful. No more than this bullet was made sinful. By this imposition of these hands by imputation to the bullock. Bullock didn't change in his nature, nor did Christ because of the sin being laid upon him. But oh, the weight of the sin. We can't even imagine it for our own. But here he was bearing the sin of his people. A number that no man can number. And so that's how we look to Christ as that sin bearer. Oh, the weight. I'll tell you, if, if our salvation depended on nothing more than us to just feel the weight of our sin as God sees it, none could be saved. Not even that. You could be awake night and day thinking about it, but none of that would even satisfy a holy God. But our Lord knew it, and our Lord endured it. The weight of the sin of that people that fought the Father purposed to save laid on him. Think of that. The pressing down hard on the head of the bullock. And therefore slain. Notice there's two part here. There's the, there is the laying out of the hands in verse 10. But it wasn't just a matter of, okay, the, the hands were laid on it. Now get up and run, bully bully. No. Verse 11. Thou shalt kill. The bullock before the Lord by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. This is where it gets bloody. But it shows us again what was required even as it says there in Hebrews that without the shedding of blood there was no remission of sins. This didn't actually put away sin but it represented in type and picture the putting away of sin that would occur when Christ came. The writer of the Hebrews said that, that the blood of bulls and goats did not remove sin. It couldn't take it away. There's no equivalency between a, an animal dying and the death required of a human being. No equivalency. That's why Christ had to come in the flesh. That's why a body was prepared him. It was necessary that man answer to man and it be a just man before God to answer to a sinful creature before holy God but all of this is typified here and when that blood was shed and it's the shedding of blood unto death that's so important it wasn't just a drop of blood let's pinprick this bullock and get some blood out here and let, let, then let's just apply that and let the bull go no this was unto death and therefore they were to take in verse 12 of the blood of the bullock and put it on the horns of the altar with the finger pour all the blood beside the bottom of the altar and see all of this we saw already the altar represented who Christ the sacrifice represents Christ the blood shed represents Christ Christ did not shed his blood in vain there are none in hell for whom Christ died I know people say well he died for every single person in the world well if he did then there's no more condemnation because the shed blood means satisfaction. Those for whom the blood was shed are the ones that are saved. And nothing required God to ever save every single creature in the world. Just like here that we're studying, this was for a particular people, wasn't it? This is Israel. There were pagan nations all around that knew nothing of this way of worship. And they died in their condemnation. They say, well, how could God do that? Pass by so many. He's a just God, a holy God. He doesn't have to save. If you get thinking that, you're in trouble. The fact that he would even consider a wretch like me is amazing grace. And that he would get this word to me and cause me to see how it pertains to his son. None of this was done in vain. All of it was done with purpose. According to God's purpose. And so they took that same blood of the bull and they put it on the horns of the altar with their finger that's how the altar was sanctified 
because the altar in of itself was man-made, wasn't it? Even though it represented the, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, yet it required also that that altar be sanctified. And that then once that blood was placed on the altar and poured out around the bottom of the altar, then the entire, see that's what we're seeing here in this sin offering. They were to take the fat that covered the inwards, the caul that is above the liver, the two kidneys and the fat that is upon them and burn them upon the altar. So we see here not only the sin offering, but secondly, we see the burnt offering. That's what's represented here as the second type of offering. It's all connected. One was for sin, but then that offering was to be entirely burnt before the Lord. This is the type and picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we come to the burnt offering now, in verses 14 and following, it says that the flesh of the bullock and his skin and his dung, every part of it, thou shalt burn with fire without the camp. So a part of it was to be burnt on the altar. The remains were to be taken outside the camp. It is a sin offering, but it's also a burnt offering as we get into verse 15 down to verse 18. So here the sons of Aaron says now, one was a bullock, that was for the sin offering. Now they were to take another one, the ram. And again, remember I said, all these offerings represent one sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just as the bullock represented Christ in his strength, so the ram. You think about a ram. That's a male goat. And think about a ram in its strength. Again, no part of this represented weakness when it came to the satisfaction of a holy God. And just as the sin offering before it was to be burnt completely here now the burnt offering that's represented here in verses 15 to 18 was also to be taken and burnt it says there in verse 16 you shall slay the ram and thou shalt take his blood and sprinkle it round upon the altar and thou shalt cut the ram in pieces and wash the inward parts of him in his legs and put them into his pieces and unto his head and thou shalt burn the whole ram upon the altar. Now to us, you think about burnt offerings, the smell. Here again, the picture that artists like to portray of the tabernacle and the offerings and the smoke going up, it just all looks so pristine and beautiful. Imagine the stench. I know sometimes we've put something in the oven and forgotten about it and then all of a sudden when you start smelling burnt flesh meat you go running in and you open that oven door and out comes the smoke and you're like oh no it's ruined and it stinks it fills the house that's just a small picture of the stench that must have been going up day and night before the Lord as the Israelites encamped around the tabernacle where all of this was taking place. When it says there was a smoke that went up before the Lord day and night, that represents the wrath of God. The burning represents his justice satisfied, but oh, the stench that represents the sin for which that sacrifice died. And yet, Look at here in verse 18. What was it to the Lord? To us it's a stench. And it ought to be. Because that if Christ died for my sin. That was my sin that put him to death. There was no sin in him. But he bore that stench. And yet it says there at the last part of verse 18. It is a sweet savor. An offering made by fire. And underscore those words. Unto the Lord. People want to make the death of Christ today as if it was an offering unto man. 
here's what he did. Now won't you just please accept him as if somehow he's being offered to the sinner? We don't find that in Scripture. This was an offering unto the Lord. Everything that the Lord did by way of fulfilling these types that we're seeing here was unto his Father. It was to the satisfaction of his Father. And yes, for us, it causes us to recoil when we think that if my sin was laid on him and my sin put him to death, how putrid must be that sin that he should so die. And yet, to the Father, it was a sweet savor. Why? Because that's what his justice required. That there be not just any death, but the very death of his son. So that's what we see here with regard to this burnt offering. It just shows how far short we have fallen, how guilty we are, and yet how gracious the Lord Jesus Christ was in his death, that he should bear that sin and that he be entirely consumed before the Father. That's really what's depicted there. The complete satisfaction of Christ in his death. And we read about it there in Hebrews chapter 10. That in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, the very will of God was satisfied. Where we could never satis be sat satisfy him, he is that satisfaction. In fact, look back over there with me in Hebrews chapter 10. And see how it's put. This is why Christ came. It says very clearly there in verse 4. It is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. So none of this actually put away sin. It was a covering. That's why in the Old Testament you see that word atonement. That means a covering. It was a covering for sin. That God, where that those sacrifices were offered, there was a forbearance of God toward the sin of his people but it still required Christ coming and dying had there been a putting away of sin by those sacrifices then there would have been no need for Christ to come but it was a picture it could not put away sin and that's why in verse 5 it says wherefore when he cometh into the world I like the way that's put when a baby's born, you don't talk about a baby coming into the world. You talk about baby being born. But when it spoke of Christ, he cometh into the world. That means he existed well before he ever came into this world. But the reason he came, it says there in verse 5, sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not. He's talking about those Old Testament sacrifices. That, that could not satisfy God. Even here, when it says it was a sweet savor, an offering by fire unto the Lord, it was a sweet savor because it pictured his son. That's where Christ, God's Father's satisfaction was, in the picture of his son. It's like I pull out a picture and I show you one of my sons, and I tell you just how delighted I am in those sons, and what do you say? I can't wait to meet them. The picture doesn't satisfy. But oh, if you ever meet him, uh, now, I see how it is. That's, that's how it is here that God could not be satisfied just with the sacrifices. And that's why it says, a body hast thou prepared me. There again, it's not language you talk about just a normal person being born in this world. Well, look at that. The body was prepared him. But for Christ, it was prepared. Why? Because he's eternal God. But he came in the flesh. But that body was prepared for one reason. That he might lay it down. As depicted in verse 6. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin. Thou hast had no pleasure. That's what we're looking at. But then said I. Lo I come what? In the volume of the book it is written of me. What, what book is he talking about? The one we're reading here in the Old Testament. You realize that the apostles. All they had to preach from when they went out and preached the gospel was the Old Testament. They reasoned with people from the Old Testament scriptures. That's why as we're going through it, we're seeing nothing but Christ. In the volume of the book, it is written of, of me. He says, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He did that which we could never do. 
not even think about it. He satisfied God's will not only in the word and in deed, but the very thought, the very spirit of the law he fulfilled in all things. And that's why he jumped down there to verse 10, by the which will we are what? Sanctified. That's the tense of that is we were sanctified when Christ died and we continue to be sanctified. It's not when you believe, if the Lord gives you his spirit to believe, that, okay, now all of a sudden you're justified and sanctified. No, it was done there at the cross. The reason any believe is because that work was accomplished for them even before they knew anything about it. I know that's my case. And it says, by the which will we're sanctified, not through your believing, but through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And then down there in verse 14, for by one offering, doesn't say he shall perfect forever them that are sanctified. I hear preachers say that. Well, if you'll just believe, then God can forgive your sins. If you'll just believe, then you can get right with God. That's my faith is not my savior. If I believe this word, it's because the spirit caused me to believe, drew my heart to Christ and saw that when he laid down the, his life, that's when I was perfected before God. And that's the sweet savor made by fire unto the Lord, that burnt offering. Well, verses 19 to 21 is the third type of offering. We've seen the sin offering. We've seen the burnt offering. They're all tied to what sin is. But the third one here is the peace offering or sometimes called the consecration offering. And there again, you see in verse 19, thou shalt take the other ram. So one ram for the burnt offering, the other ram. It says that Aaron and his sons would put their hands upon the head of the ram. Then shalt thou kill the ram and take the blood and put it upon the tip of the right ear of Aaron, upon the tip of the right ear of his sons, and upon the, the thumb of their right hand, and upon the great toe, of the, the right foot and sprinkle the blood upon the altar round about. <laughs> you say, well, isn't there enough bloodshed already? Remember, it's a bloody book. No amount of blood of these animals could ever completely typify the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. But here where that blood had been shed, now it was to be taken and put on every part of Aaron and his sons. The tip of the right ear, the thumb of their right hand, right on down to the big toe of their right foot. This reminds me of when our Lord was going to wash Peter's feet and he refused. He said, no, Lord, not. He said, if I don't wash you, then you have no part with me. And what did Peter say? Oh, Lord, then my whole body, go ahead and wash me. And what did he say? He that's clean has not need but to wash his feet. Think about what the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ has done for the sanctification, the consecration. This is the peace offering. This is why there's reconciliation with God and not just part of us. I know that's hard to believe when you think about this flesh and who we are in our sin nature. And yet, because of the blood shed of the Lord Jesus Christ, every part. And you think about what the ear represents, what we hear. You think about what the hand represents, what we do. And you think about what the toe, the right foot represents, where we walk. You cannot be any more sanctified or justified before a holy God than you are already in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. If that weren't so, I'd have to close this book, go sit down and just wait for condemnation. I don't preach because I'm in any sense in my own person, a holy person. I know people like to refer to you as reverend. Don't ever call a man reverend. There's only one reverend. That's Christ himself. I'm just a humble servant. But I'm thankful for that bloodshed of the Lord Jesus Christ. Whereby those for whom he has paid to sin debt are wholly sanctified. Justified. That's one of the scriptures the Lord has brought home to my heart from 1 Corinthians 1.30 from years ago. That he was made unto us, what? Wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. That he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. And that's certainly where the glory belongs. 
We're going to have to stop there. We'll come back to it and see how we continue down through this portion as to how this was a wave offering before the Lord. That's the next type we'll look at. But I pray in what we've heard during this time that the Lord bless it.